Welcome to the New City Church Podcast. My name is Steve Andres. I'm the pastor of New City Church, and we're thrilled that you've joined us for this week's message. Every week at New City, we invite people to experience new life through trusting Jesus, learn a new way of honoring God, and walk in a new purpose of making disciples. If you're looking for more info on New City Church or other resources, go to newcity.life today. But for now, enjoy this message. I think we should really say thank you. I was talking to a couple parents out in the lobby, and I was laughing with them that when they dropped off their kids, I was like, did you um, just need to take a minute and be here in the lobby and be like, and we're standing here together without children, and it's amazing. Um, before coming to church. Let's, let's say thank you to all of our children's workers um, and, and everybody in our kids' ministry. New City Kids is, is killing it. They're doing a wonderful job. We appreciate them so much. And we, uh, I, I wasn't going to, this actually wasn't that, but we do need your help. And so parents, if you served once a month, it would just, it'd be a game changer. Um, and you're like, well, I only come once a month. Moving on. Uh, I, I know that uh, Annabelle and, and Ashley on the video there, they talked about uh, Dr. Dick Foth. He is uh, one of the greats uh, and, and somebody who's had an enormous impact on, on me uh, and my ministry. And so it's really exciting that he is uh, partnering with us, that, that we have this series of content that we're going to be working through together as a church and that he's going to be here with us for this seminar and on uh, Sunday morning, March 26th. So that Heart and Soul event is going to be just really phenomenal. I want to recommend it to you just to plan on being a part of that. Uh, it's one of these things where, um, you know, there are, certain, there are certain moments where you're like, oh, what are they going to talk about? And I want to see if this is... And then there are certain people who you're like, it doesn't matter what they talk about. And he's one of those folks, for me anyway. Where I say, it doesn't matter what he's going to talk about. I'm going to, I'm going to be there. I want to listen. And so I want you to be a part of this uh, as we go through this series and uh, as we kick off our discipleship season next weekend. Uh, it's been mentioned there's lots of different ways to engage in this. And probably the easiest way is to download our New City app and, and then to be able to get all the content is right there. You can do it at home with family, with your spouse. You can do it with a friend uh, over your lunch break at work. Uh, it's really just 10-minute videos uh, where we're going to kind of watch through that and then some discussion afterwards. And my friend Brian Dwyer has really one of the greatest definitions of discipleship that I've ever heard. And he says it like this. Discipleship is a series of conversations. And I'm like, Wow. That really lower that makes it that makes it something that we can all do right because when when you when you have that heavy word discipleship it sounds so intense but really what we're talking about is a series of conversations uh, where whereby we can kind of grow and be rooted more deeply in our faith and where we can bear fruit in our lives so that's what this is about I'm going to invite you to stand with me I want to read our text today. Um, We've been in this series, and we're concluding it today, 23 and me, and uh, we're talking about 2023 and me, for those of you who might have missed the reference, okay? 2 Corinthians 9 says this, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. God will generously provide all you need. Then you'll always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. What a great promise that is. As the scriptures say, they who share freely and give generously to the poor, their good deeds will be remembered forever. It's not even in the notes here. It's not really, but that's a legacy right there. Okay, never mind. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, God will provide and increase your resources, then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. You'll be, yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. What a, what a, this is such a phenomenal passage Today, I want to talk about it. I want to talk about generosity, and I want to talk about giving. But don't worry. I know that everybody gets a little tense when I say that. But, we, but today, this is one of the most wonderful things. If, if this could be set free, and if our hearts could be set free to be generous, there, is, there are very few other things in your life that are going to produce more fruit 
and more joy in you than when we get this right. So let's pray and ask for God's help. Lord, thank you today for your help. Thank you for your word. And I pray, God, that it would take root in our hearts, that our hearts would be good soil, not the, not the soil where the seed would just kind of come up briefly and then get, and then, and then get, get uh, withered by sun or by heat. Lord, I pray that it would be seed that would take deep root in our hearts and produce fruit a hundredfold of what was sown. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I have, um, I had an experience. I feel like the tip calculators are getting out of hand um, when you when you pay like a digital sort of pay method because the other day it was like my choice was literally 35, 40, or 40% 40 tip. And I was like, that's aggressive. <laughs> that's aggressive. And it, wasn't, it wasn't even a, it wasn't like there was no server. It was just, I was just ordering at a counter and I was like, wow, that is really bold of you. But I'm like, all right, you know, because, and I'm, I'm like doing things, it's only a couple bucks, but you know, like it's the print, this is what we always say, it's the principle of it. But for me, I'm thinking to myself, you know, uh, all, all these things for me, I'm like, uh, the 35 and the 45%. I, you know, this is the thing. We all kind of do the math in different settings because we don't like to part. This is something I learned a long time ago. People don't like to part with their money. Like, this is my money, and I don't want to part with it. We like each other. Right, And so we don't want to part with our money. People don't like to part with it at all. And there's a reason for it. It's because, it's because our money represents more than just numbers in a column. It represents more than just you know, dollars. It represents the hours and the effort and the skill and the investment that we had to trade in to get that money usually. Right? That's most of, that's most of everybody's story. And so when, when, you're, when, we're asked, when we're asked to part with our money... We're asked to give a piece of our time, effort, energy. And so I want you to know, uh, I understand that. That's how it is for me. That's how it is for you too. But, and, and maybe even because of that, all throughout the Bible, there is this conversation about money. And it's talked about as so close to our hearts that we need to pay attention to it. It, re it represents that work, our security, our status so much that it's woven in, Jesus says, it's woven in with our hearts. That literally, if you want a map to where your heart is located, Jesus says, look at where your money is going. So I read that passage and I want to share with you some things today. Uh, long ago, I, I gave up the idea of, of being shy about talking about this topic and I have to remind, and I talk to our staff, and I talk to our leaders many times, and I say, listen, giving is a discipleship issue. It's not a, it's not a dollars and cents issue. It's a, it's a heart issue that, that has to be addressed and needs to be talked about because it is so close to our hearts. As a matter of fact, Jesus talked about it more than he talked about heaven, hell, or many other topics, right? And so you think, though, those are the big ones. He should have been talking about it. But he says giving. Jesus ended up talking about this so many times because Jesus was wise to the whole idea. This is a part of who we are. So let me give you some thoughts, and I hope to encourage you today I hope to leave you with a sense of uh, actually feeling refreshed and challenged a little bit through what I'm talking about. The first thing that I think is important for us to recognize, even from our text, is this. Generosity is God's idea. And maybe that's even a poor way to say it. Generosity is rooted in who God is. The text starts out, and the Apostle Paul, who's writing to this group of believers at a city in Corinth, he says, listen... God is the one who gives seed to the farmer. He's the first. God is always, always has the initiative in giving, and that's good for us to remember in our lives. God gives seed to the sower. I was listening to a podcast a few years ago now, and uh, there was a guy named Larry Fink. He's the founder of BlackRock Financials, and uh, he has a, he, it, it was a podcast, I, I, can't, I actually can't even remember what the podcast was if I thought I didn't put it in my notes, but um, it wasn't like a finance podcast. I think it was, a, I think I do remember what it was. It was, it was a, a guy named Donald Miller. He was interviewing this guy, Larry Fink. And his net worth, I think, 
uh, the last I checked, you know, because you can Google these things, was a, around a billion dollars. Now everybody's, you know, if you're a billionaire, I mean, what's a, what's a, what's a, what's fifty million dollars between friends? You know, like it could go up and down, whatever. So the, the guy's insanely wealthy, right? He's worth over a billion dollars, and 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 this is what he said. The question was, if you knew you were going to die, and you and you had the option to purchase an additional year of life, what would you give, what would you be willing to pay for that additional year? And his answer was, without hesitation, his answer was, I'd give it all. I would zero out the accounts, I would start completely fresh just for one more year. Think about that. Think about how, how significant that is. That, that when you woke up today, you got breath in your lungs, your eyes opened up, your consciousness was there. You said, oh my goodness, I have a day, I get to go to New City Church, and I get to see all the f- great folks here, and you got a billion dollar gift today when you woke up. You got a billion dollar view when you looked out the window. <laughs> you, you are living, I just, just everybody say, I am living. A billion dollar day. (laughs) Do you live with that kind of breath to breath gratitude to God for the gift that he has given you just to wake up today and to be alive? Everything. Let me just say, not just the breath, not just the life, but everything you and I have in our lives. The Bible says every good gift comes from our heavenly father, from the father of lights in whom there's no shadow of turning, meaning he is consistently always giving. He is consistently always generous. He doesn't have an up day where he's feeling good and he's generous and another day where he's stingy. He is always giving. Some people say, well, I got all this stuff, but I worked for it. I had to, gra- I had to go out and get that bread. I had, to, I, had, I had to go to school. I worked. I stayed up late. I, paid, I stayed up late nights. I, I paid for school. I did all this, and then I started this business, and I grew it from the ground up, and all we went through all this stuff, and it was so hard, and I worked for all this with my gifts, with my talents, with my energy, and I say, who gave you those gifts? Who gave you that talent? Who gave you that energy? <laughs> Every good thing we enjoy in our lives comes from our Father. Who blesses both the righteous and the wicked, the Bible says. He sends rain to fall and sun to shine on both of them. And so when we're blessed, we shouldn't feel like, oh, this was my thing. Or I'm particularly good and deserving of this. Because if we're blessed, it's simply because he's good. Jesus talks about money and says, follow that money. Find out where your heart is. Every time he did it, he talked about it with parables. And, and I, there, was this, there, there was this revelation I had the one day, as I, literally because I was going through every one of the parables that Jesus told about money. And it just dawned, the most obvious thing, have you ever had this moment where the most obvious thing in the Bible, like you're like, how did I miss that for 20 years, <laughs> right? How did I miss that for, for, for all this time that I've been reading these things? And I just missed the very obvious thing that every, in nearly every story that Jesus tells about that relates to giving or to money or to finances or anything else, there are people who are managing someone else's resources. <laughs> the, the characters in it, literally, the main characters, the characters where, where we're supposed to put ourselves are actually managing somebody else's resources. So here's the second point that we need to understand. We are managers, not owners. For a season, for a time... Though that, that's who we are. We are managers, not owners. And so if, if in some way we feel like maybe, you know, we, we, have, we have ownership of something, we need to keep in mind that we actually don't get to keep any of these things. We were created to hold something in trust for someone else and to cultivate it to flourishing. The, 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 the word for that is we are stewards, okay? Everybody say Stewards. Not a very common word in use today, but it's a great word for us to remember because it means that I don't own it. I'm actually just stewarding it. I'm actually just taking care of it. And my job is to make the most of it because it's been entrusted to me. There is a, there is a wiring 
that we have in our lives, that we are wired to feel satisfaction in good stewardship. From the very beginning, God speaks to Adam and Eve, says, hey, listen, I'm going to let you lead here in this scenario. I've given you so many good, I've given you everything you need. You're literally in a paradise, but your job is to take what I have given you and to cultivate it until it flourishes. You got to tend the ground. You got to manage this stuff. You got to do well with it. You have to steward all of this. And it's going to be what, my, what I have entrusted to you. We're supposed to be satisfied in that. But let me just tell you something. Sin has a way when it creeps into our lives and into our hearts. That selfishness, that self-centeredness has a way of making us obsessed with being owners when we really are not the owners at all. And so we find ourselves wanting to cling to things that are not ours to cling to. We find ourselves wanting to grasp at things when instead we should be living with an open hand. If I realize that every good thing that has come to my life is actually from the wise hand and generous hand of God, and that he's asking, he's entrusting it to me to hold on to for a time, then I can hold on to it loosely and purposefully with the end in mind. God's hand has entrusted to you and me all the resources and good things that in his wisdom, he determined that we should manage. So remember today, generosity begins with God. And you and I are not owners, we're just managers. Thirdly, generosity is an antidote to me first living. When you and I give, as the Bible tells us to give, and I want to talk about it, it's an antidote to living for me. I have told this story before, and I, but I do not exaggerate with this at all. Um, I, I was literally sitting in a Starbucks once, and there were a couple of folks. This was just, this was right before pandemic. There were a couple of young adults sitting next to me. I don't really know how old they were, maybe college age, maybe a little bit older. Um, but one of them was saying to the other, they said this, I, I really, I want to own a business, um, and they were thinking really hard. Um, I want to own a business, but I don't want it to be risky, um, and, I, and I don't want it to be stressful, but I, I really want it to be lucrative. <laughs> and I thought, oh, how cute. <laughs> because you could ask any business owner, and they will tell you that it's going to be risky. It's definitely going to be stressful. And if you're really lucky, it might be lucrative, <laughs> right? And I just thought this is great because, because here, it was like, I just, I just want it to work out for me and me only. And, and that's, that's, I mean, I can poke fun at people, but that's how we all are, right? We live in a me-centered society. We live in a me-centered, uh, you know, culture. And so this is what I, we, we, we love to focus on me. Get me some me time right? Get me some, I got to take care of me. But here's the problem is me first doesn't work in every situation. You cannot be a me first mother. Can't be. That's one of the things. Oh, there's, there's just one. I mean, there's a lot of babies at our church, a lot of babies, a lot of children, a lot of, a lot of young ones and a lot of folks, you know, like, you know, starting families. And I'm like, oh, every parent looks at other parents to be and is like, oh, you're about to find out. <laughs> you're going to learn. <laughs> because no matter how, that, that's one of, the, one of the beautiful ways that God uh, refines us as people. Part of the plan, I think, for a lot of people's lives is to have children because nothing will teach you how to be other-centered quicker than having kids. Can't be a me-first mother, Right? I'll tell you what, marriage is not a me-first scenario. You can't be a me-first husband. It doesn't work. A healthy marriage works when two people prefer each other. That means it feels like sacrifice all the time for these two folks. I will tell, I'm, I'm, I'm doing some premarital um, meetings, some counseling with some folks, and I'll tell you, listen, it only works when you feel like you're losing all the time. <laughs> Everybody who's, I mean, that sounds funny and maybe cynical or negative, but it's not. It's when you decide in your heart, I just, I just can't live like this where it's going to be me first. It only works if I prefer you and if you prefer me. And then somehow, when we're both leaning in that way, then it actually produces something beautiful. It produces life. 
Because you don't get a harvest without the sacrifice of sowing. You have to let the seed go, <laughs> right? I, I, I'm, I'm not a farmer. I don't know anything about it. I can't keep a plant alive. We've got all fake plants in our house. I, I, long ago, I learned, don't put a real plant near me. They, they, they give up, right? They're like, oh, this is, good. This is just, just kill me now. <laughs> but I do know this, that, that just like we said in our first week, I don't know of any farmer that just come harvest time, stands over the mud saying, man, I, I pray, God, that you would make there be plants and I don't know anyone who's standing over the dirt. Oh, God. Need you. I need you right now. Get that corn here, God. They don't do it because they know they got to sow the seed first. And there has to be something. You have to be willing to let go of the seed in order for there to be growth. And that's so important for us to see. Malachi uh, 3.10 says, I'm going to give you this verse and I'm going to get real and I'm going to get raw with you right now. Everybody say, ready? Ready? Okay, here we go. Malachi 3.10. Will a man rob God? Yet, this is God speaking through the prophet Malachi, you are robbing me. He's a contemporary of Nehemiah and Ezra. For those of you who know those stories, these are, this is all the time after these people who had been in exile came back by God's grace and a miracle. They come back to Jerusalem. They're rebuilding the walls. And then Malachi the prophet stands up and says this for God. He says, will man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. You say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? You're cursed with a curse because you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Now, I'm talking about this today because I believe we need to hear about it. There is this me first living, but then there is another mindset, which is a give first living. And that's what God is saying. The first, the first fruits, that's what it was. The first of your harvest, the first of your earning, the first of whatever is produced in you by God's gracious hand. He says, bring the, bring the first part of that and bring it to the Lord. It should be sown as a way of acknowledging that God is our source. So let me tell you about what tithe is is to clear up the confusion because I, I know this is, let me just say this, tithe is a word that means 10th. Now just track with me here because I, I want you to understand, but I've got quick points today about what tithe is and this is for your instruction so you understand. Tithe, it was the command of God to bring the first 10%, the first 10th of, the, of earnings or harvest to the Lord and the pattern for this was set before the law was given in the law, and then Jesus affirmed it. Okay? So that, that's just, it just means 10th. So sometimes we say, some people get it confused and say, I'm going to tithe, but they're really talking about an offering. I'm going to give a little something. In the, I'm saying tithe is a 10th. Okay? Here's the second thing. Tithe is not about time or talents. Those should be available to God as well. Right? But when Jesus talked about money, he was talking about money not volunteer hours. Some people say, oh, I tithe with my time. And they know you don't. You're giving, you're, it's wonderful that you're serving the Lord, but you, you can only tithe with your, with your money, with your resources. Thirdly, tithe, oh, this is, a, this is a big one. Tithe is not generosity. It's faithfulness. It's obedience. When I tithe, I can't pat myself on the back saying, what a generous guy you are. Because all I did was give back to God what already belonged to him. That's the deep part that I want you guys to see. That's what Malachi is talking about. Will you rob God? It's like if, if you lent me, you know, you know graciously, I, I just need help. I can't make ends meet. But would you lend me, you know, a, you know, a, a $1,000 I need to be able to make this car payment. And I got to do these other expenses and groceries or whatever else. And, man, you're like, oh, I got you. I got you. And then I come back to you and I, you know, a month or two later, I've, I've been able to make that money. I give you that thousand. I say, here you go. <laughs> generous, right? Oh, that's not generous. That was you. 
I, it was lent to me. I'm, I'm simply, this is what I want you to see. It is not about generosity. When we talk about generosity, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. It is a cultural thing that if we are, if we are givers, that it produces in us. Let me, I'll just tell you that. People who tithe tend to be the other givers. They tend to be giving in all places of their lives. And God does this beautiful thing. I, if I had been better prepared today, I, I know there's stories within our church I got, a young, I got a young man who I challenged because we were talking about finances. And he was, he was like, man, I really need, I can't put it, I can't make ends meet. I can't make it work. And so we're talking about it. And literally we sat down with, I said, here's your, here's your number one problem I got to show you. Is you're not making ends meet because you're not tithing. It seems counterintuitive. But I said, if you will just do that, put that first there's a very practical thing, number one, that you learn how to work with the 90% that's left over and you end up being wiser and better steward of that 90%. That's practical. But then there's a spiritual, supernatural thing that happens where God says, test me in this. Just if you do it, I'll throw open the floodgates of heaven. And then at this, I'm not even lying. And I'm, it's, not, it's public, I'm not, I'm not breaking any confidence because he came back and shared it with our small group. He's like, man, I've been tithing for a couple months and you guys would not believe my whole life has changed. And the number one thing, he said, I got a girlfriend. <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's the floodgates of heaven. <laughs> That's a blessing. That's what he's been praying for. I'm like, I, you know, I, I'm not trying to, I'm not, this is not me trying to be manipulative, not trying to be unfair or unkind with you at all. But I will not, I, I, it's God's word that says, just test me in this. If you'll be obedient in this, I will bless you. It would be wrong for me as a pastor not to challenge you with this because I would be withholding a blessing from you if I didn't teach you about this couple more things about the tithe. It goes to the storehouse where I'm fed. That means the church where I'm worshiping. Some of you visit here at New City Church, and, and it's great. Some people will come and bring an offering. They'll text an offering in, or they'll, they'll go onto the website and give it, and that's wonderful. But if you have a home church, that's where your tithe goes. Right? I don't go to, I don't go, to uh, you know, go out to eat at, at, at Chili's and then drive over to Houlihan's and pay the bill. Where you're fed, I don't know if any of you guys, I don't even know if Hula Hands is around anymore. <laughs> is Hula Hands around? Okay, great. Good for Hula Hands. My point is this. You tie to the place where you are worshiping, where you are fed, where you are rooted. That's what you do. Lastly about this, tithe is countercultural. I am aware that when somebody comes into our midst and somebody up here is on stage talking about giving 10% of your income, that they're like, what? This is crazy. It is counterculture, much so that they are never in need. So I just want you to know it is countercultural. It is a little bit counterintuitive, but I want you to see the results of it at work in your life. God knows that this is difficult for us. So God says it's the only place where God invites us Put me to the test, he says. Put me to the test. And don't, he's a, and watch how I rebuke the devourer. I mean, I got a friend. His name is Trev. And we were texting just last week because we both have January birthdays. And Trev, I don't know if he still is, but for a minute, he was the world record holder uh, for powerlifting for his age group, okay? So a combined bench, squat, deadlift, the world record holder. Big dude, like a house. He's as wide as he is tall, okay? Not, and, and so whenever I'm with Trev, and I've been with Trev in some places around the world in different, you know, different spots, and whenever I'm with Trev, I am bold, I walk a little taller than I would. I speak a little more boldly than I normally would because I've got Trev with me. And who is going to mess with this man? I mean, he grew up in East St. Louis. He did time in the military. I mean, he's got the whole workup. He's, he's, just a, he's just a beast, right? And so I am like, I can say whatever I want because I got Trev. Because if you're going to come at me, I'm going to say, Trev, rebuke that man. <laughs> 
if it were just me rebuking the devourer, I don't know that the devourer really pays attention to me. That's what, I, I don't want me. I don't want you. I don't want you. No, thank you, you. No, thank you. I don't need you to rebuke the devourer. The one who I want to rebuke the devourer in my life is God. And so if I can do anything, the Bible, God says, test me in this. Just bring in trust, in faith, and watch. I will bless you, and I will rebuke the devourer in your life. Some of you have been arguing with me internally through this whole thing. <laughs> I know. And, and you might have questions about giving and about other stuff, and I understand that. Listen, I, there, there's no intent. I'm not taking an offering at the end. There's no intent to, to strong arm you in any way. I want you to think. I want you to argue with yourself. Try to identify what is at the center of the resistance that you feel in your heart. What is it? And it could be that you feel that you have been manipulated or it could be that you feel like this has been abused in other settings. It could be, but many times, at least for me, even with me, folks, I'm the pastor. I know I'm supposed to be perfect in every way, but I, I've shared this with you before. When I am doing that little thing on my computer where I've got to click, they shouldn't have the confirm button at all. But when you give, it'll be like, boom, the confirm. Are you, want, you sure you want to do this? I'm like, ugh. Where is that resistance coming from? Is it because I haven't seen God's blessing? I have. Is it because I don't see God's faithfulness? I do. Is it, I'll tell you what it comes from. It comes from that very core part of who I am that believes that I'm an owner instead of a manager. It's very rarely about the money. It's so often about the heart. Psalm 126 says this, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. What it says is every time we sow, there might be that sense of sorrow in it, that letting go of something and trusting it to the Lord. It says that those who go out weeping with tears, as they sow, will return with sheaves, that is, with, with, with the harvest and joy. Now, our culture has become so pain-averse, so sacrifice-averse, so discomfort-averse that we've been led to believe that anything that causes me discomfort or requires something difficult of me is borderline abusive. We have. And yet, how will we reap? How will we ever reap in marriages? How will we ever reap in family? How will we ever reap in church or in cities if we, if we are unwilling to sow in discomfort or in tears or in difficulty? How will we ever reap if we're not willing to do the hard work up front of sowing? There's no way for me to be fruitful without forfeiting something. Could it be possible that there is a, a season of fruitfulness in your life that is going to be kicked off by a moment of forfeit and a moment of giving and faithfulness? Fourthly, and I got to go quickly here, generosity outlives me. My wife, Jesse and I, we love the show. It's been a while since we watched it, but for a while we were on this kick of watching like Diners, drive-ins, and dives. Right? Anybody into that show before? It's great. It's kind of our speed. I love a good diner. That's like, it's actually like my safe place in life is a great diner, right? Where you like sit down and the server comes up to the table and talks to you in a real gravelly voice. Like, here's the specials. And do you want some coffee? And you're like, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So we have a list of those diners and, and dives that we want to visit, and we're never going to get to all of them, I don't think at all, because we don't have the time or the money or, uh, you know, for the medical expenses associated with eating like that, right? <laughs> There's a limit to how many times I can eat something like There's a limit to how many pancakes I can enjoy in one sitting. There's a limit to how many, you know, like greasy burgers I can really stuff in my mouth, uh, you know, whatever it is. There's a limit to all of those things. 
And that's part of you and I learning about what it means to be human, that God has put limits on our ability even to enjoy the good things because they're not meant to be ultimate things. They're just for here and now. The twin temptations of humanity are, I've said it before, I've said it, I've written it before. I don't, it's not, it doesn't preach very well, but permanence and prominence. We want to be something big and we want to last forever, right? Our obsession with fame in our culture is about being remembered forever, being something big. Our obsession with youth is, is rooted in a hope of everlasting life. Our obsession with wealth has to do with both of those things because if we're wealthy, we might be famous and we might be youthful and we might be able to kind of keep it going for us and build a monument maybe to my greatness so that all generations will remember me. And to that, God says, what are you talking about? I, I got to kind of skip ahead here, but I had this moment where I was, rem, where I was thinking about our series title, 23 and Me, and the, the, the byline that we've been saying is, hey, how do you build a life of legacy? And I was the one, I think I was the one who like said, hey, let's do the byline. This is what's in my heart. How do we build a life of legacy? Then a few weeks ago as I was preparing for, the, for, for, for this, I, I, I realized, what am I talking about? I don't build a life of legacy. That's actually part of what I'm talking about. That's the problem is my obsession with legacy is part of my problem. God builds legacy. And if it should please the Lord, let me say this, if it should please the Lord to give me a legacy in life and to allow me to outlive me and, and, and people to remember me for, you know, one generation, nobody gets remembered for more than like three generations. That's it. But if it should please God to do that, then that's his business. And if it should please God for everything I put my hand to, to be forgotten the day that I die or the day that I move on, then so be it. He is the Lord. It's God who builds a legacy. And so you and I, our job is to be obedient and faithful to him, trusting in his goodness and believing that he will do what is best for me. Think of how much time we spend worrying about our resources. Is it possible that God has an even better plan for our resources than we do? Money is a means in life, but it can never be the meaning of life. And that's why it doesn't get much time at funerals. Nobody's like, today we remember so-and-so and his net worth. And thank goodness that he did. It doesn't get any time. Nobody talks about that. It's on the, the interactions. It's the relationships. It's the family. It's the, it's the purpose that they had. It's what God did in and through them that gets the time at funerals. What do you want to be celebrated for at the end of your life? What do you want to be thanked for? And let me just say this. For those of you who are wrestling with this or maybe who need some guidance, if you don't have a plan and a purpose for your money, for your resources, then your appetites will eat them all up. That was, I, 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 there's some lines sometimes in the sermons that I'm like, that is probably the one that mattered the most. <laughs> if you don't have a plan, if you aren't purposeful with what God has blessed you with, then your appetites will eat it all up. So a guy named Nelson Henderson said this. He said, the true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. So I titled this sermon, Pay It Forward. Because if I'm asking the question, how am I obedient to God? And how can I live in a way where my life could outlive me? The short answer is, let God do it. Trust your life to him. And he will make something blessed out of your life so that you can be more of a blessing than you ever could be in your own cleverness. It's God who gives the increase. Some people water, some people sow, but the Apostle Paul said, it's God who gives the increase. Now, he was talking about the gospel, and it's, and it's kind of like, you know, kind of growth in different areas, but I think it applies to this as well. So, lastly, fifthly, you've been blessed to be a blessing. Whatever God has put in my hand, it's so that it can be a blessing to others. If it's influence, then let my influence be deployed for the blessing of others and for the kingdom of God. If it's resources, let my resources, let my money be deployed for the kingdom of God. If it's opportunity, let it be maximized for the kingdom of God and for the glory of God and for the blessing of others. You have been blessed to be a blessing. 
Okay? Now just, just think about that today. Some of you are like, you think I'm trying to twist your arm to give. I'm not. Just, just be encouraged today. God has blessed you today. And he loves you so much that he doesn't want the blessing to stop with you. He wants you to be generous, obedient and generous, and to be a blessing to others. And he will make that happen as you trust him. In closing here, there's a passage in John chapter 12. I'm going to just paraphrase it here for you. Andrew and Philip, two of Jesus' disciples, are there. And they come to Jesus in John 12, and they say, Jesus, there are some folks at the door here. There's some Greeks. There's some Gentiles at the door, right? So th- there, there, were the, there were two groups as far as Jesus and his followers were concerned. There were the Jewish people, and there was everybody else who were the Gentiles. And Andrew and Philip are saying, Jesus, there's some, there's some Greeks who are here who want to see you. And Jesus, in the text, it's like his whole demeanor like changes in a moment and it's one of these moments where when you're reading the text, it's, you, you miss some things if you don't know the background. And it feels like a non sequitur. It's like, why did Jesus says this? They say, hey, Jesus, there's some guys at the door. They're Gentiles. They want to talk to you. And Jesus literally says this. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And Andrew and Philip are like, so should we let him in or what? And you, you're wondering, why, why does Jesus say that? And this is the answer. The Gentiles at the door were a sign to Jesus that his ministry, that to that point had only reached out and touched Jerusalem and Judea. Though that, that very local ministry was now ready to move outward. And so Jesus says this, I tell you the truth. This is what he says next. I tell you the truth. Unless a grain of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new grains, a plentiful harvest of new lives. So here Jesus has been and his whole ministry has been about been about teaching and healing and ministering to the sick, those who are in Jerusalem and Judea, the Jewish people. And now he's got the Greeks at the door and he says, you know what? I've done all I can with my preaching and teaching. The only way for this blessing to go beyond me is for me to die. I've done all I can without sacrifice, Jesus says. All of the miracles, the teachings, the the, the sermons, the parables, they're all good, but I need to be a blessing and the only way I can continue to be a blessing is for sacrifice to be part of my story. The hour has come, he says, for the Son of Man to be glorified. All this other stuff, Jesus says, was just preamble to the real purpose for my life because Jesus says in order to have the ultimate harvest of these souls of humanity's redemption of change and transformation, of the inbreaking kingdom of God, of, the, of, the, of a life, of what you and I enjoy today, Jesus says, in order to have that ultimate harvest, I've got to make the ultimate sacrifice. 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is reflecting on it, and he says this, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet, yet, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. I want you to know this today. All this talk about generosity, all this talk about giving and teaching about tithing, it's wonderful, and I believe all the words, but it's all built on this foundation of the incredible, lavish love and generosity of God for you and me who don't deserve it at all. Jesus laid down his life. The Bible says, though he was rich, He became poor for our sake. Think about that today. What that means, it's really simple. Because before we talk about dollars and cents, we talk about what God has given to us, that breath and that life that is ours. And the Bible is so clear that you and I, though we were given that great gift, we decided to walk away from the giver. We said, I'll take the gift, but I don't want the giver. And in that breaking of that relationship... That was our end. That was, what, that was the poison that is killing all of us and that is the root of every bad thing that we see in our world. But Jesus, 
because of God's great love for the world, sent his one and only son, the Bible says, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn us, but so that through his son, the world would be saved. This is for you today. Some of you here today, you know that there's a break in your relationship with God. Aren't you glad today that Jesus became poor so that you and I could receive the riches of his grace? Paul says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus. That was how good. You know how good he is. He was rich, but he, came, he became poor for your sake. So before we go today, I don't have an offering to take. I literally have it. I have a question for you. I'm going to invite everyone in the house to bow your heads for just a moment with me. And my question for you is this. I'm not asking about dollars. I'm asking about your life. I'm asking about your heart. If you say today, I need to give my heart and my life to him. I need to be reconciled to my father. And I recognize that it's only because of Jesus. Not my good works. Not, my, not even my giving today. I can't buy a spot in heaven. It's only because of the grace of God. And you say, I need that. I need that relationship to be restored today. And I want to give my heart and my soul to him. If that's you today and you want me to pray for you before we go, I want you to raise your hand. And we're going to do that as we dismiss today. Thank you. Thank you. Three. Anybody else? You say, I, I, that's what I want. I just want you to raise your hand. Thank you. In the back there. Thank you. Five, six, seven. Praise the Lord. You could put your hands down if I counted you. You can just lift your hand. If you still need to lift your hand. And we're going to pray together. I'm going to invite everybody in the house here to, to repeat this after me. And really plainly just to say, God, I'm giving you my heart and my soul. And for, for many of us, this is a prayer of confession that matters for us to pray today. Not just these uh, eight folks who raised their hand, but the rest of us here today, all of us to say, Lord, I give you my heart and soul today. So say this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to. You rose from the grave to give me a, a, a purpose on earth, a place in heaven, and a relationship with your Father. So today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper, and heaven is my home. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Let's put our hands together for these eight who received the Lord today, and let's bless God together.